Aloha. Uh, I, I, I just told Paul that like, each time I introduce the keynote speaker, I just pop it up. So I'm thinking, what should I say about Paul? I'm still thinking, language in. <laughs> so I met Paul the same time as I met Stephen Suna in 2009, Gordon College, right? And so at that time, I was still struggling with my, I got my degree, I worked in Michigan State University for a few years, but I was exploring new methods to look at how online, what you space, how people communicate, harmonize and learn, the whole process. And I captured video data of avatars, all screenshots of many, many hours of online playing, role playing games. And I was doing, uh, using software called Transana to transcribe action data, languaging data, um, and the movement data as well. So I met Paul at the right time, and he introduced me to his wonderful book called MTTA. What does it stand for? Li Wan, I gave you a test. We use the textbook. Multimodal text analysis. Multimodal. Discourse text analysis. Uh, Multimodal transcription. Transcription text analysis. Exactly. exactly. It had me thinking for exactly. a Exactly. Yeah, it was exactly. the emptiness that you could. Yes, the emptiness that we have the opportunity for, yeah. for a conversation, for your role to come into the introduction. So, since then, I studied on my own and I published the first paper using that. Um, technique in the language sciences where Bert Hodges and Sune helped me tremendous amount first multi model uh, data on, um, based on multi model analysis and then I continued to offer that course I think this is like the fifth time and this summer I just offered it in China as well so each time I have the book I have the video I have my conversation with me so Paul we lived far apart but you are always with me oh, okay. and with my students. <laughs> what? Why is that so funny? <laughs> well, actually, when we talk about interdependent emptiness and T, we are always interconnected, aren't we? I'm a piece of... Paul has a piece in me, I have a piece in you. Your ideas always influence me and my students, right? To me, that's interdependence. <laughs> It's not just something, it's, don't use a label that you recognize this figure. But within me, there are Paul, there's Stephen, there are my friends, my students, all of you. Every morning when I do meditation and I see, I think all the people I have been interacting with and I am with, and this morning, and since the conferencing, I've been thinking everybody showered with wisdom and compassion. That was our first days. Theme today, uh, yesterday's theme was emptiness, and today is chi. All right, so, so I, <laughs> I give you my chi to you. No, it's a, a really great pleasure to be here, of course, and among so many friends, and also to be able to meet you, you people who are interested in in these things that we're talking about. But above all, a special thanks to Don Ping and the organizers for uh, the invitation to come and to talk at this uh, event. So um, I feel as though I'm a bit like a fish on a line again. <laughs> so, and because I'm used to lapels that are remote. So if I trip over and I pull everything to the ground, don't believe me. OK. Um, right. OK. So. As you see, I, uh, the, the topic here, the linguistic imagination, and um, I call it nature's trick and culture's treat. And basically what I'll do is, I'll talk a little bit at the beginning about those two ideas, and then um, from there go into the idea that languaging enables, simulates, and supports different kinds of virtual experience in the imagination. And in fact, I think that's one of the central functions of language. Um, and I'll consider that in a little bit more detail with respect to a few examples, this all depends on time too, but of uh, Dex's 
uh, uh, this, that, and, and relate that to the idea of stimulated grasping. Uh, then event, which, which, of course, that, that's in the noun phrase or the nominal group. Uh, then a couple of examples, which will be imperative clauses or event dexes. Again, and simulated pathways of physical and intellectual movement. Okay, there, and then, um, right. And then I'll move in. So, that, uh, and there are, there are a few video and other examples to show uh, those things. Then I'll, then I'll move to the idea of, uh, of text, uh, briefly anyway, and consider uh, the fact that texts, after all, are embedded in activities and we do things with them. And I'll consider texts from this broad point of view, how they can stimulate processes of imagination. Um, and that will, you know, and, then, and I'll try and elaborate a bit on that, the kinds of awareness, uh, non, essentially non-perceptual forms of awareness that texts can simulate and promote. Um, and how they catalyze what I'll call experiential flows. And there I'll return to an old chestnut, which some of you will, of course, know from an earlier article, but I won't be saying the same, I won't be repeating myself uh, just to. And, um, and if time allows, I'll come to what's labeled here example four, um, and that, okay, which is a pedagogical episode in a literature classroom in a Hong Kong university, and um, then a few concluding remarks. So, okay, but let me, let me get up, uh, underway. Um, we all know, I think, that children are, uh, infants uh, in, with, in particular, are amazing imitators, right? So, let's jump straight to a little video here. sense of things. Um, basically, uh, and it's very interesting, uh, in three different talks I went to, um, Professor Wang from Wanzhou, uh, Hannah there yesterday, and also, although more implicit, Li Wei today, the, 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 that amazing video he showed, we saw clear cases of uh, mimetic or imitative thinking, uh, sorry, uh, acting out of things going on and that. And I think I'd like to start by saying imitation is not mechanistic repetition or something, say, the infant has observed, but it's a way of participating in or indicating willingness to participate in others' activities and to receive attention, in the case of the infant, from caregivers. Okay. In other words, if you think back of the old discussion way back in the 1920s from Piaget, Ecolania, uh, as he called it, uh, it's a way of attracting the attention of others, um, of being attracted to what others are doing, seeking to join in. Well, you know, it's about togetherness, basically. Uh, it's a mode of social participation which extends creatively, I might say, extends the self. This is part of what I would call, because we see it right from the beginning in the earlier stages of the infant's life. So I'm calling here imitation nature's trick. Uh, Okay, so, uh, okay, the um, cognitive neuropsychiatrist Marcel Kinsborn has said that it's primarily about affiliation and of entraining to and integrating with the activities of others. So, you are, as a way of forming social bonds with others, okay. Uh, and if you like, it's a way of inhabiting another person, so to speak, um, in affiliating with another through imitation we seek to apprehend the other and to find out what it's like to feel and so on from the other's embodied point of view. So imitation, in other words, is a form of empathic identification that underpins and supports that, remember, I'm talking about very early stages of development here, forms of, what, forms of enskillment that later will give rise to languaging and in fact, maybe already are the very, the most primitive or primordial forms of first order languaging of course, without any second order at that point. Uh, so, for example, when infants entrain to the speech rhythms and melodies 
of the others who inhabit their, their world. Okay, so um, now la languaging has its uh, developmental origins, and I'm not going to go into the evolutionary thing, but quite possibly its evolutionary origins to in the embodied intersubjective expression and the regulation of affect, feeling, and emotion, as the pioneering work of people like Steinbrook and in Oslo and, and Colwyn Trevathan have over the last few decades shown so well. Um, imitation, then, I'm saying, is nature's trick for enabling one individual to inhabit the body of the other, and thus um, the feelings and emotions and so on, of, of the other. And it's, a, it's the means whereby we learn, okay, um, it, the bodily skills for meshing with and harmonizing, say, my or the infant's bodily and neurohormonal dynamics with those of others. In learning particular skills from others, we share and inhabit, in some sense, others' bodily experiences and actions. I think of what Professor Wang said as a form of creative extension. And I say he was talking about dialogue. Okay, but I think you can see its origins in these much earlier forms of uh, communication between infants and caregivers, right, right in the very early stages, as, as the little clip shows. So nature's trick basically enables us, or provides a basis early in development for transcending individualistic utility. Uh, in development, if you think of it like this, the musicality of the pre-linguistic rhythms and melodies of the, in, in the infant mother dialect grounds that togetherness that I mentioned, the empathy, if you like, and the social bonding that's, that's such an important aspect of the diet, especially in the first year. Now, intersubjective experience and imitation, as I say, enable humans to transcend um, utility. We can reach out and inhabit another's embodied uh, experiences. Okay. So, and in imitating and in learning through the imitation of others, we exercise, or we start, we, the, 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 the early, very early forms of enskillment, we exercise or begin to exercise our own agency, and that's what the infant in the little clip I showed you is already doing. We make choices, uh, although it's not conscious choices in the case of uh, infancy, about what to imitate and learn in accordance with specific values that we're seeking to realize. Now, um, in doing that, we shift our own evolution. If I just jump back into the evolutionary story for, for a brief moment, we shift our own evolution away from blind necessity and chance and in ways that are more and more under the control of our own choices, our own agency, uh, and our own values realizing uh, behaviors. So, yeah. okay. Um, what, one thing that's clear from the developmental story is that languaging, first order languaging, is grounded in the intrinsic musicality and therefore in the body of, and the world of embodied experience. Nature's trick, as I call it, enables us to inhabit the embodied experiences of others and to extend beyond ourselves. I also, I'm, I, I'm aware um, that I'm at the East West Center, okay, at the University of Hawaii. And um, in my PhD years, I, was, I became thoroughly steeped in the writings of Gregory Bateson, who in the very early 1960s was, uh, I think, director of the East West Center, and certainly he, here in a prominent way. For example, the work on deuteronomy learning in dolphins and, mm -hmm. and other things he did at that time. I'm not going to talk about that. Just to briefly, that, that, this slide's dedicated to Gregory Bateson, if you like, mm -hmm. that, given that I'm here. I think we have to know a little nod to him. But he wrote about, in a 1951 book, <coughs> Psychotherapy with Rouge, a psychiatrist, he wrote about, and also subsequently he, he developed this idea, what he called then the command uh, or relational aspect of communication. In other words, that aspect of communication broadly defined, we're not, we're not talking about language specifically, that is about how we relate to others. Okay, um, And there was also what he called and co uh, the, uh, the content dimension uh, of communication. Now, that brings me then from nature's trick to a little bit on culture's trick. Because as many people have said in the last few days, human languaging, because it also has a second order dimension, okay, enables us 
to transcend both embodied experience and what in Gibsonian terms uh, we call the stimulus flux, okay, and to evoke in the imagination content, okay, uh, in other words, to orient us to non-perceptual forms of, of awareness that are activated in the imagination. Now, um, I've got a quote here from Gibson's 1979 book, and he talks about knowing as an extension of perceiving, right? He says, the child becomes aware of the world by looking around and looking at, by listening, feeling, smelling, and tasting. But then she begins to be made aware of the world as well. She is shown things and told things and given models and pictures of things, then instruments, tools and books, finally rules <coughs> and shortcuts for finding out more things, etc. Um, I'll jump a little bit. Um, he mentions toys, pictures, words are aids to perceiving provided by parents and teachers. They transmit to the next generation the tricks of the human trade, in other words, human culture, um, and so on. So, um, the point I want to make here that's implicit in what Bateson says, um, and Bateson basically at this stage in his career was, was moving away from code theories of perception and, uh, um, to develop um, the uh, ecological model that, that we uh, have often drawn on in our work. Okay, but I want to say that for, as a starting point, linguistic pattern makes available information uh, so when I say linguistic pattern, I mean things like the wordings, okay, that Stephen talked about in his talk uh, the other day, it makes available information that enables speakers, writers, and of course, readers and listeners to activate and direct the imaginal processes, so, okay, of others and, that, uh, and themselves, and to enable them to imagine or to have a non-perceptual awareness of an experience that they've not directly experienced. And with with reference to language in particular, the Gibsonian who first started to work on this uh, was Robert Verbrugger back in the 1970s and, and early 1980s. Um, so he, he, for me, is an important uh, source and influence here as well. Okay, so uh, in other words, the, the utterances of speakers functionally can constrain, direct, enable, guide, and scaffold addressees in the linguistic constitution of forms of virtual experiencing um, by evoking in memory prior experiences through the linguistic pattern that, that are reactivated and then get integrated to present circumstances in the creation of imagined or virtual experiences, because they're virtual experiences. So in this way, um, languaging opens up gives access to and enables us to navigate in that virtual world of linguistically constituted experience, okay, which is essentially virtual. And, and Verbrugger had already identified this, not in the same terms, what's, what Sunni here has called the extended human ecology. So languaging enables us to integrate second-order cultural resources, for example, verbal pattern, to prior histories of perceiving, okay, and to present circumstances in order normatively to evoke for self and for others forms of both perceptual and non-perceptual awareness in the imagination, including, as I said, of imagined things not directly experienced. Um, okay, and so, I mean, that's very different from a co-viewer language, but that, that need not detain us right now. Um, well, just to say that um, once you're able, th through the second order meaning-making resources of languaging, of languaging um, we can um, create, constrain, scaffold, and attunement, to use a Gibsonian turn of phrase, an attunement to forms of imagined experience, okay, including obviously novel experiences. For example, when predication in second order language enables different patterns to be combined in new ways. Think, for example, unicorn. Okay. Um, now, I'm not going to talk about unicorns, or there's a wonderful story here by, by Thurber, but just that, uh, you know, for me, unicorns are real in the sense that they exist as patterns, okay, in the culture. They're, they're, not, they're not unreal, but I'm not going to 
dwell on that problem. Okay, but the point I want to make is that they recombine and transform familiar patterns of two having to do with body shape, a particular animal, the head of a horse, the tail of a lion, in a single horn in the middle of the forehead of, of the unicorn, and that has magical... Pro all these things are predicated of it, okay, in, in the imagination, okay, um, etc. But unicorns, uh, I'll leave unicorns behind that. Okay, so... Um, all right, but, but many other animals have the capacity to reason, think, and of course to communicate. But what characterizes humans, I think, is their capacity for imagination and creativity. Music, dance, poetry, art, religious awe and wonder, moral sensibility, humor, irony, the ability to change one's mind, and so on. Okay. Now, all of these are basically useless things, non-utilitarian. We live in a frightful neoliberal age where everything's meant to be useful, and, and, and so on. Um, okay. And th there are efforts which amuse me, where neoliberal capitalism seeks to co-op co at least some of these to utilitarian ends. Think of the idea that art lowers your blood pressure, and that's why you should engage with art, because it will lower your blood pressure. Okay. Uh, and that, that's not made up. Okay. There are lots of other examples. So, anyway. Uh, um, okay. I think languaging, then, is a complex evolved hybrid of these two tendencies. Okay, one coming from nature's trick, okay, the other culture's trick. One is oriented to, uh, and this may be a very Western perspective, maybe we can sort that out later, uh, oriented to utilitarian manipulation of and, de and detachment from the world. So the classic subject of object distinction, okay, that's been around in the West for quite a while now. Uh, and a world that it seeks to order, manipulate, and use. Okay. And the other is the empathic, oriented to contextual holders of ecologic, the ecological connectedness of things, including the self and its world. And it has its origins, you might say, in those earliest forms of intersubjective engagement that I, I talked about in the first slide. So the non-utilitarian capacities, or that is the non-utilitarian imaginative capacities of humans culture's treat, I'm calling it, undoubtedly arises through the interplay of both of those tendencies uh, and their origin and foundation in nature's trick, imitation. Now, imitation then constitutes the primordial foundation for the capacity to reach out to the world of the other, okay, in the way I suggested earlier, without, without utilitarian purpose in acts of creative affiliation exploration and engagement. Okay, so uh, I guess this slide's a little bit of recapitulation of a few essential points. He uh, you can see the heading, language enables, simulates and supports, because not, it's not representational in the sense of encoding prior things, rather it simulates. The brain is, as, as Alain Bertoz, as uh, the neurophysiologist, shows in his work, the brain is a simulator okay, uh, of, of our work. Okay, so uh, it, it's in that spirit I intend this. So it enables, simulates, and supports virtual forms of experiencing. So if you think of it, say, phonetic gestures or vocal track activity, we just narrowly focus on that, um, uh, are a means of catalyzing. In earlier work, I've talked about language as a catalytical process. Okay, catalyze, guide, and support flows of simulated or virtual experience. That, are in a, that, that the structure of language, its patterning and so on, its wordings, in some way enable and constrain, support, guide, and so on. But they don't encode, okay? Um, so if they did encode, then there'd be some kind of structural isomorphism between what's encoded and the means of encoding. But clearly it doesn't work like that, okay? And I, I don't want to dwell on that. So it's a functional constraining process, uh, an enabling process. Okay. Uh, so it's able to evoke in the imagination to constrain and guide flows of this linguistically constituted forms of experience uh, in, the, in the awareness, in the consciousness of the participants again, okay, some interactive encounter. Um, I think that'll do for that. Oh, well, except, yeah, I'm now going to move on to the first example. Okay, phonetic and other related gestures support and guide the manipulation of spatial 
and perspectival frame as a reference. Okay, so that takes me, actually it would take me to a glass of water first. <laughs> <laughs> a brief, my mouth style, a little bit dry. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now, here I'm going to focus on, on this. Now, um, we have two participants here, husband and wife, having a bit of a, uh, an argument about which pens work and don't work. And, and Nolene, who's the wife, of course, is holding a pen and she said, she leans out across this little table or bar to her husband and says, this is the one you have. And she sticks the pen in front of it, like that. Okay, now, uh, before, I'll play the video in a second, but just a, a few things. So you could say, uh, utterance as a, but, all right, first of all, they are anyway a form of gesturing, okay, for, as, I, uh, as the work of Carol Fowler, amongst others, uh, shows phonetic gestures. Okay, okay, but also is it maybe a, the utterance may be accompanied by, and often is accompanied by a gesture, uh, or it may incorporate a simulated gesture. <coughs> And, and datics often work like this. So, um, datics may be integrated with an actual gesture of some kind, or they, 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 incorporate, or they can incorporate a simulated gesture. Okay, and this and that, the contrast between this and that in English, not nicely show this, and I'll show you now, we'll run through a few examples of that. Uh, okay, so she says, this is the one you had. Okay, and that's integrated with her hand gesture, when she holds the pen out to show to her husband. Oh, here, here comes the video. Yeah, no, oh, this first. is the one you had. Oh. Okay. Yeah, no, oh, All right. So, yeah, okay, one could say, all right, here, the, the, uh, the deity, this, okay, ego-centered gesture originating from her frame of reference, but it serves, it serves to locate something the pen that she's holding in relation to that frame of reference and to present it as near to hand, okay, as graspable, okay, and I'll develop this idea of grasping uh, a, a bit more, a little later, as graspable as an object in the field of coordinated attention and action, okay, with her husband, her, her interlocutor, okay. So it presents the object, a pen that is, to him as available for immediate prehension. Okay, like, as we'll see later, that contrasts with that. Okay, so, and basically that's, that's building on an extending action perception. Okay, so here we have a good example um, uh, of uh, language as extended action perception. The other thing that's interesting is that in this example, uh, you often see this with, with say, dating this. Um, and, and then the, and a second video also shows that there's grasping involved. Of course, she's holding things. There's grasping and manipulating. Okay, and I'll come back to that point. Okay, uh, so she interactively presents the pen to Laurie, her husband, as something available for immediate prehension. Okay, and in other words, he can mentally simulate, okay, a, a reaching for and a grasping of the pen as an object that's both perceived and entertained in thought as the one he had in the recent past that actually worked. Okay. Because uh, there were a whole lot of pens there. That, uh, he couldn't get any of them to work. Okay. And she can show. Okay. Another example. This one is uh, re returning to an old, an old example, but for different purposes. Okay. In a brief, uh, we, we see um, one boy here, that they are responding to an instruction on the computer screen. They're playing a game with a girl's team, okay, uh, and they have to make up, the, the computer's directing them to make up different kinds of stories, so they're competing with a girl's team. Here is the turn of the boys, and on the screen it is, uh, late, later I'll show you the text, but uh, a bit later in the thing. Um, the computer text instructs them to describe these nasty horrid creatures that had landed on Earth from another planet. Okay, now, uh, and what, where am I? The boy on the right there, they, uh, you see uh, at that point they're oriented to the screen. Then, then they, um, uh, uh, he says, well, they sort of look like this. So I'll come back to that later. But when he says this, he takes the other boy's ears, the boy on the left's ears, and pulls them up. 
So there's, there's the rasping again going on. So I'll just play this now. Um, yep, here we go. Well, Okay, uh, so we see again the synchronization of this with an act of grasping and manipulation of, of something out there. Yeah, okay, um, so he grasps and manipulates the other boy's ears in order to, you know, reconfigure them as alien in such because he turns the other boy into an alien. Okay, uh, okay, so uh, oh, here we see things like very pr precisely timed, uh, it, this is in skilled embodied and skilled activity, first order interactivity, first order languaging. So we see here things like the importance of precisely time, right down to milliseconds, synchronization of body dynamics, uh, okay, and a particular action and the, and the utterance uh, uh, at that particular stage in the utterance's development, okay, in, in relation to the affordances of the situation, specifically the ears of the other board. Uh, we see how one, the, the utterance shifts um, the other boy's attention to particular features of his body and the potential for becoming alien features, etc. So there's a whole attentional shift that changes bodily orientation and awareness. Okay, so, um, and while the bodily is doing obviously a lot of the work here, it's not doing all, all the work, so we have to also account for the verbal, okay. Um, okay, the, the wording that we hear in his utterance. Um, but, um, and I'll come back to that point in a moment. Uh, Halverson, a British psychologist, I think, back in the 30s, um, uh, did work on prehension, forms of grasping and its development in the first year of infancy. Basically, in work, uh, studies in, back in the early 30s, he, he, he talks about prehension as the act of reaching for, grasping, and manipulating an object. And he writes how around the, the age of one year, the infant develops the feeling group as distinct from the holding group of early infancy. Okay, so the feeling group enhances perceptual exploration and the manipulation of the object that's being gripped. Um, now, I, I want to say here that Daytic this extends, builds on and extends this principle of uh, digital grasping in, in, in a Halverson sense. Halverson makes the point that digital grasping using the fingers is more delicately articulated than say grasping the hand. Okay, it, okay. it therefore enables more fine-grained perceptual exploration. Uh, so we, what I'll call dactic grasping, which we see in these two examples, we, we can think of in, ter in, in these terms. Uh, Reaching, gr 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 grasping, manipulating. Okay, so dactic grasping is still more finely articulated because it coordinates verbal and non-verbal uh, ways of exploring actual and virtual objects. Okay, uh, as pointed out, the dactic may be either accompanied by an actual gesture. Okay, and that both those video examples show this. Uh, a reaching, say that reaches for grasp, manipulates an actual object, the pen or the ears, or it may incorporate a simulated gesture. Here's an example from written text, then we'll leave this behind. Okay, this is from student evaluations of, uh, of their professors at, a, at an Australian university. <laughs> well, I'm not sure 12 hours of teacher contact time a week is enough. I think educators should use class time to develop strategies and skills not just say, now you can work on your projects. I can do this at home. Okay, I'll stop that. Okay. So, uh, this sphere act activates a mentally simulated uh, reaching for, grasping of, and the manipulation of a particular virtual object in the imagination. In other words, it incorporates a simulated gesture. Okay. So, it, but this anaphorically, of course, points back to you can work on your project and makes it available for immediate prehension by entertaining it as a current capacity that the writer can exercise at home. Okay. So the writer here mentally manipulates and explores the object that's grasped by dictic this as something that, that 
he or she can do uh, in a particular place. Okay, so I'll leave this behind. Just briefly two uh, examples of that. If you contrast it with that, you see that that indicates something that's no longer within reach, that's not feasibly available, or is no longer available, that is for immediate prehension and action. Consider the famous words of Neil Armstrong as he stepped on the moon in 1969. Uh, he said, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. Okay. Um, now, the, the dated that there, in his utterance, locates his first step on the surface of the moon as now out of reach, as already accomplished, no longer graspable. Okay. So again, we have the ego-centered perspective. But in this case, the dating integrates a bodily gesture of the speaker, his stepping on the moon, uh, and places it within a coordinated field of attention. But so something that's now no longer with it in our grasp, me mentally or physically. Okay, so our... Hang on. Oh, that's one example of he has disappeared. <laughs> Unaccountably. Oh, well. Um, that, so... I don't know what happened to it. It's really strange. PowerPoint, a strange thing. Uh, I'll have to forget that one. Yeah, I don't know what happened to it. It's okay, it's okay. no, no panic. Uh, oh, there was a second example of that, but it's actually gone. <laughs> it's no longer within reach. Yes. <laughs> 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 I have no idea what's happened. Okay, uh, I didn't delete that, that's for sure. Um, okay, a couple of examples with uh, uh, event dates looking at imperative utterances. Oh, I'm running disastrously out of time. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, imperatives are proposals for action that they propose a simulated bodily action or a shift in attention and awareness that's prospectively anchored in the other, in the FSC. So, if I, um, you see this here, okay. Nolene's imperative utterance, she says, yeah, look, she's holding the pen in front of her husband, uh, is integrated with, the, with her action there. She's writing on a bit of paper on the table, okay, to show him that this pen actually works. So, I'll just show that one. Don't buy any like this time in the room. Here's the part of paper. Put it out. Bring a new That's not a brand new pen. You've got a pen that that for you? That's not that one, though, is it? Well, there's not one. It's one of those. It was a the sign. There's nothing wrong with that one. Well, that one's a bit weird. There's a sign that I'm saying to you. I didn't say it's a fan. Yeah. No, no, this bird. is the one you have. Well, there, there, there we go. Like the, yeah, what she said. So, the imperative utterance here uh, simulates a proposed shift in attention that seeks to place her non-verbal action within a field of coordinated action and attention with respect to her husband. Okay, so it seeks, the utterance, I mean, seeks to operate on and manipulate that spatial frame of reference, uh, his perception, that is, the husband, and, 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 and perspective. So the simulated gesture look in conjunction with the action, that is a scribbling on a bit of paper, functions not only to modify a pra the, the pragmatic situation involving their perceptual coordination, but it also seeks to provide him with the husband, Laurie, with access to knowledge that the pen uh, she's just demonstrated, that, that it actually works. Okay, so, um, oh yeah, I, here it is, now I see. This, uh, um, <laughs> Yeah, it's just popped up in the wrong way. Second example, that's okay. Okay. Um, the, the, um, sh this, this show called One Step Beyond was a precursor in the late 50s. It's all on YouTube. Uh, late 50s and early 60s. Precursor of the Twilight Zone and, uh, and Outer Limits called One Step Beyond. And the, the presenter of it was the late John Newland. Okay, and I gotta go, I gotta go out of this, okay to, we've got it here, okay. To what someone was going to say just before he said it? Or have you ever walked into a strange room and had the sensation that you'd been there before? Well, if you have, you've taken a small step beyond. Now watch a giant step. <laughs> okay, that'll do for that. 
What was that? We all want to see it. Okay. So, uh, I'm focusing here when he says the imperative utterance there, as he, he he's you know, before, just before the show starts, now watch the giant step. And by the way, I wondered if Neil Armstrong was influenced by that. I've no idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, um, so yeah, we, you just heard it. I don't need to read it out or anything. So that that imperative utterance. Now watch the giant step. And of course, immediately proceeds the show starting. Okay. Uh, so the temp we've got the temporal date now, together with the imperative, simulates a prospective gesture on the part of the addressee, okay, who's the, the television viewer. Um, in this case, a simulated gesture of watching TV, or watching the program, I mean, and of taking that one step beyond, is more than just physical action, because it involves in simulated emotional and intellectual activity engagement. After all, it's anticipatory, that's prospective. In other words, the utterance indicates that the episode which is about to start, called the captain's guess, okay, is now within the viewer's grasp, both physical, emotional, and intellectual, if he or she is willing to make the effort to dedicate his attention and to follow the program, to, okay, it, it, and, and then to enjoy it, to find out what, you know, to find out what happens in the left. So the simulated gesture here both points to and creates an awareness in the imagination of a prospect, uh, yeah, prospective pathway that the viewer potentially can move along. Okay, so uh, in operating then on spatial reference frames, changes in viewpoint, fields of coordinated action, attention and awareness, both themed axis in the noun phrase or the nominal group and event axis in the clause, seek to move participants who are co <laughs> coordinated by a particular utterance in and out of actual and virtual spaces. Okay. Uh, this, this entails movement not only of the physical body, I mean that's also the case, but also intellectual movement of, so to speak, the mind in and out of virtual spaces. Okay. Now in all those examples, we see that the speaker's vocal track gesturing uh, are basically in skilled techniques that enable intentionally mo modulated simulations of what Beethoven calls perceptions, you know, perception action, and, and these have the capacity to move participants, like the husband, like the, the second boy, etc., etc., in, in and out of both physical and mental or virtual spaces by activating and guiding participants' imaginal processes along specific pathways that are laid down by languaging. Um, so, um, and I'm seriously concerned now about the time factor. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> How much time have I got left? Okay. Uh, I'll go to one, t yeah. Uh, I'll have to skip all that, just a sec. Yeah. Because um, I wanted to say, let, let's go back to the, uh, the, the episode with the boys where one makes the other into an alien. Okay. I just wanted briefly, in the time remaining, I'll develop the idea. He, that, on the left-hand side, we have what's on the computer screen. It says, all the inhabitants are shocked by the appearance of these strange creatures. They keep on asking each other, will they be peaceful and friendly, or will they be really nasty? Okay. Before you go on, pretend that the invaders are really nasty, horrid creatures. Your group must give a description of their characteristics. Now, I don't need to replay the, 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 uh, the video, but what I think is happening is, uh, what, what interests and other examples I've looked at, is that the text has the capacity Okay, to catalyze flows of action, awareness, uh, and so on. It catalyzes what I call here an experiential flow of movement, action, feeling, perception, performance, and of course more languaging too. Uh, so text in these flows are, are of course co-constrained. <coughs> the text doesn't determine, I'll come back to that in a minute, rather it's more like catalysis. They have their functional capacity, that is their affordance layouts, you know, their lexicogrammatical wordings and, and so on, have the functional capacity to either activate and also in, or in, that is, inhibit flows of the kind I just mentioned. Um, and 
lots of other things you could say about that. Okay. Um, what, in both this example and in another one I won't be able to show, which is role, role play in a literature classroom in, in a Hong Kong University, what strikes me is the improvised character of the experiential flows catalyzed by text. So rather than being rigidly determined, I mean, such, some things like, think of uh, in call centers, the very scripted behavior of, of the workers in a call center. That's highly determined, highly scripted. But here we see something very different, okay? Because the text is activating these imaginal processes. So rather than being rigidly determined or programmed by the linguistic affordances of the text, the experiential flows that they prompt and activate have this improvised character. Uh, so you could say that the, the, two, the imperative clauses like uh, pretend that the invaders are really nasty horror creatures, etc., uh, they don't determine, but they functionally constrain and enable uh, these flows. There's no encoding going on. Uh, these flows have, and this is a really nice example of this, uh, they have Characteristics such as the, there's, there's, there's the spontaneity of them, okay? That, that's flexible, adaptive behavior. Um, there's fine-grained, as, as the video thing showed earlier, fine-grained bodily awareness. There's the, the, the people involved, the boys say, are able to make use of few available resources on the fly. For example, the ears and, and, the, and then the tie, the other boys tie. Uh, the flow is bounded by its own emergent rules that give it a, a consistency and predictability. The aliens one goes on for some minutes. I only showed you uh, bare 30 seconds at the beginning because I don't have the time. There's an unrehearsed willingness to put oneself and the performance of oneself at risk. Okay, and there's, of course, they, they because it's also in response to a text. We see how they combine textual and performance aspects. The performance seek to express some idea, so to speak, derived from the text and to insert it into a larger performance, which they create on the fly. Okay, so all those things I find really, so how these, in the imagination, these experiential flows are catalyzed by the affordance layouts of text. And I'll skip that one, and I think I've got to skip all that too, because how is the time going on? Um, zero minutes. Zero minutes. Two minutes. Uh, well, no. if you want to use Q&A time, um, it's up to the audience then. I could just jump to the last slide and conclude. Yeah. Or I could show one more video. We can negotiate that for half an hour, but we don't have time for that. So, um, I guess people I'm, like to ask questions and enjoy that Q&A time for interaction. All right, well, that means I'll skip the second video. You made a point. Yeah, that, that also is very interesting. But, um, okay. Um, well, um, I don't really have much more to say then. <laughs> okay. Um, just a few points to summarize. Learning to language is in skilled activity in the human ecology. Okay. Um, some of the things that happen is uh, we learn to recognize when our vocal and other bodily dynamics matter. Okay. And, and all. Uh, we recognize and make use of what Stephen has called sayings, you know, um, um, in order to differentiate different kinds of situations and to operate and transform the situation and their conventions. Okay. We also uh, orient to the, and all these things are forms of enschoolment, is, is the point, uh, the normativity of cultural, including verbal pattern, uh, and how we integrate that to first person experience in the stimulation of, Im of imaginal processes. And um, we develop and use different kinds of cultural and ecological skills and techniques. And vocal tract gesturing is, is a central technique here. Uh, and, and we, through that, individuate selves who become skilled at orienting to and displaying norms in particular ecological task scapes, like, like the ones I showed. And we use these wordings to evoke perceptual and non-perceptual forms of awareness and to make it present in situations. It's virtual, but we presence it in the situation. And, and that, that also can help us to think and to solve problems and, 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 and all sorts of other things, uh, etc. So um, that, that's all, really, except to say thank you 
And it's not trick or trick, it's trick and trick. <laughs> so nice to hear someone pointing out that the, the, the imagination is part of what we do yeah. and not some sort of strange mental thing within the head. Um, and, I mean, how could imagining be anything other than what you do when you imagine? Yeah. And most people believe that. It's absolutely yeah. I mean, as, as you said, the mind is not something <laughs> in there. It's a set of that, capacities and dispositions. That's really nice. I mean, the other thing I, I very much liked about the paper is... is in this world where everyone believes in communication, and especially where you show the videos, you bring out the importance of what we study in PICO analysis, and how it is that little bits of language suddenly become so important, and how, how some wordings are apparently what I called sayings. I didn't know I called them sayings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the whole point is that most of the wordings don't matter at all, but, but some of them can. So yeah. lots of interesting new stuff there for me to chew on. But one thing really worries me about it, mm. and that is you seem to be using simulation in a rather representational sense some of the time. Oh, here we go. And, right. and, and Larry Barsalu, <laughs> Larry Barsalu unashamedly uses simulation in a, in a representational sense. Um, can, you, can you simulate this? Don't do it, simulate it. You did it, you do it? it? Mentally. Yes, that works. But it's not mentally, you simulated it. You simulated it by imagining it, yes, yes. and so it's something that you did, yeah. right? Yeah. Now, during the night, I had a funny dream, and, and my dream went, um, if I remember right here, it was a little tune, um, the rain in Hawaii falls mainly in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> Can you simulate that? Um, that? Yes, because I can locate that in some imaginary and you just did two in the upper yeah. time or, or place. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what Alan Bertos would say mm. is those two experiences are very different. Because when you simulate a movement, mm. um, you're simulating press axiom. Yes, yes. It's something you do, which is straightforward. Okay, that's but great. when you simulate something that is striking, like a semiotic event like I gave you, more happens. And so you're not just simulating, you're emulating. Okay, I take and I think you really need that distinction, yeah, no, I, I because I think the core of the distinction between humans and other animals, and the great error of Larry Barsalu, lies precisely there in trying to reduce everything to sensory motor simulation. Yeah, I, I just think that's a terminological thing I can readily correct, update and correct. And I, uh, no, I take the point. You, uh, do you agree? Yeah, it's not representation. But I see, I see where you... But, but that then also takes you that if you've got to emulate things, you have to keep making them up. Yeah. But, but that's you've one got of to be the... vicarious and bad. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, that's right. That's the vicarious, that's the virtuality and so on. Yeah. But when we have predicational language, we are able to do that. Like the unicorn, I, I shot through it pretty quickly. But, that, you know, because we can combine things in, in, in completely normal ways. And we can't not combine them. And we can't not do so. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Okay. And take and take off stances on them and so on. That's right. Yeah. That's right. yeah. Thanks a lot, Paul. That was really, really interesting. So I had one thought uh, during your uh, your analysis. Uh, I think mainly caused by Stevens mentioning it the day before uh, John Allman's critique uh, of uh, of what we do, and in that article, it's particularly you and me that he critiques. Uh, and one of the critiques, mainly regarding you, that I, I would like to bring up here, because I think it's, it's an interesting question. Now you're virtually present in John. <laughs> 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 yes, hi, John. Presumably you're home or something. Um, so, so, John, maybe this is the one who talks about this as a kind of scientist. He does that, of course, from a Harrisian yeah. integrationist point of view. He says that, so that we have this like uh, shift from a kind of scientific way of speaking of these events with we have the spectrographs and so on, and then turns into a kind a, a mode where it takes the the mother tongues or rather that our own experience as speakers to understand uh, what's going on in this um, in this clip. So, for instance, the one with the ears. Mm. Um, and so, one way of asking the question, I guess, from 
no, I don't want to put it into his point of view, is the question of, so when you go into that, the linguistic or the words, wordings level, um, in what sense does your point of, in what sense does it matter that you take a distributed point, a logical point of view on the wordings and not a more traditional linguistic coding uh, point of view? Um. Well, I mean, I mean, I don't think you disagree with this. The, the, the wordings are um, um, I, one. Remember what he said. This is not the encoding thing. Mm. Okay, so say in a classical stratified model, so what wordings would encode meanings? Phonology encodes wordings. Yeah. That, that kind of thinking. Uh, so, but but um, but the wordings that are being invoked. That's 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 a phenomenological. That's why I mentioned Stephen's idea. But he just. So of same, it's okay. But the, the phenomenological skills we have developed for recognize something as what we call the same. Okay. Or okay. uh, well, maybe it was Nigel actually, uh, mm -hmm. Nigel Luff, okay, who formulated the idea of the same. Okay, so, um, so we can evoke it and integrate it to present circumstances. But to me, I can't see what the problem would be with John Ullman, because that would be very integrationist type thinking, actually. Be integrated to present circumstances in order to evoke uh, and to guide, uh, stimulate, etc., some kind of virtual or non non or, or non perceptual form of awareness. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're not aliens. There are no aliens there, but somehow they are made to be there. Yeah. It, you know, but the wordings are crucial. Okay, yeah. uh, in in their integration with all the pico scale, the, 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 the other the other aspects, the, the bodily aspects, and so on. So, I don't, um, so it's e e evocation of non-perceptual forms of awareness, uh, basically. But it's grounded in bodily interactivity. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, big one. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, as always, there's so many things uh, there for, you know, for us to digest. Uh, I'm interested in the time course um, in this. You, when you talk about uh, imitation, uh, it, it, it feels like it's something that happens after another person's contribution, as it were. And then you talk about uh, uh, synchronization, which is happening at the same time. But an important part of the imagination is anticipatory. Yeah, actually, so it's, it's yeah. sort of what goes yeah. before uh, that. We just really want to want, want to hear more of, of your thoughts on that kind of time course, and how much of it is anticipatory? Well, um, first of all, just a clar point of clarification, and then I'll uh, try and answer the question. Just bear in mind that what I call nature's trick is the earth, and that's the point of that first video with the little boy and his dad, okay, was to show that that lays the foundations for starting to extend beyond the self, and as I said, inhabit our, you know, our souls, and their feelings and experiences and so on. Yeah, I mean, the, the, but the point about anticipation, which I've written about mm -hmm. in, in my work, is that as, as all, all living systems are intrinsically anticipatory, mm -hmm. okay, because they're, 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 we're oriented, I so say we as humans, so that just a confined point to, to humans, oriented to uh, the ante anticipation of, that's not prediction, of course, but something different from prediction. It's um, and I think, let's say, l languaging, but also uh, perception of that as forms of interactivity, okay, with the world, set up uh, and anticipate the potentialities for their future development. In a way, Bhakti formulated that idea using different terms, uh, way back, you know. The, and uh, so did Reed in the Gibsonian tradition, and they drew, drew on his term, prospective awareness. So all these forms are, you know, because they're anti Nolly, the wife there, with a, in the pen one, is, is anticipating, locating her husband's potential response in that virtual space, and that's anticipatory. Uh, so that's always oriented, that's why it can't be, I mean, Big Art's made this point, can't be encoding, decoding, that's oriented to potential future development of, of the interactive trajectory. Okay. Um, so you integrate past with present circumstances, and future and possibilities or potentialities for its future development. Um, I didn't emphasize that very strongly because, one, I can't say everything, 
in a short time, but, but absolutely it's an important group and, and it's certainly important in my work. Is there a moderator? Oh. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, yeah, I can't, I'm as bland as a bat, so I can't provide. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I'm your extension of your eyes. Oh, okay, thank you. It's extended perception. It's extending it into a virtual dimension. Okay, because it's, it's anticipatory. Okay, in the way we just talked about too. Okay, because he's in, in that case he's introducing the TV show. Okay, and but it, but what what I, my point was it sets up there prospectively or anticipatorily. Okay, um, a potential pathway down which the TV viewer might go. At the, if, if, so it's simulated in, uh, or well, Stephen's corrected me on that. Okay, but um, yeah, but there's the virtuality of it, is the point there. It sets up a virtual pathway. You might just switch <coughs> off the TV at that point, not be interested, but you can potentially go down it. So it's setting up, as I just said to, in responding to leeway, setting up potential for future interactivity. In other words, the further development of that utterance's potential in relation to things that might come. Okay, so utterances are, even when they're not explicitly modal, are always implicitly modal. Okay, and that's part of their anticipatory dynamics. Uh, because they, they're not about the encoding of actualities, they're about the setting up of potentialities for their further development. And already Bakhtin understood that a long time ago. You're referring to the aggressivity? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Can I have a quick follow-up? What's the relationship between focusing right here and now with the anticipatory perceptual extended perception? Um, I think the basic thing is that, is that you, know, you, 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 you have to draw on past experience. Things are getting evoked in memory. Mm -hmm. Because part of the process is, and, and Fabruga points this out, you know, uh, the, the affordance, he doesn't use the term affordance layout, but the linguistic pattern in the utterance on the basis of our prior experience, both personal, first person, and cultural. Okay, so it's the population and the individual scales all come together here. But um, uh, prior experience, uh, you know, it's red integration, okay, that, that, that 19th century, early 20th century theory of memory. But if I am walking in the woods in Norway in the summer, and I hear a rustling in the grass, say, when I was a boy in Australia, I liked to, I was actually quite locally famous for this. I, I collected lizards and snakes and that and gave lectures. Uh, so I hear uh, there aren't many snakes in Norway, although I have caught them in Norway too. Okay. Uh, but if I hear a rustle in the grass in the summer in the wood, I'll be reminded, so I'll red integrate experiences from my uh, earlier years in Australia, even though it may not be, be something, not, not a reptile at all, but you so part of an experience has the capacity to evoke the whole, you then integrate that to present circumstances in ways that anticipate future, pos future potentialities. Okay, so the, the temporality that integrates right. past so to present to, to potential. Simultaneously, this body, this here now, integrates and connects and bodies history right now and future. Yeah, yeah. One more quick last question. Uh, uh, I want to ask a question that is about in your one slide you talk about language is from 
grounded in the intrinsic musicality of musicality and in the body of the world, uh, the world and body of things. So I want to know how do you understand musicality? Uh, well, there's the melody of, of, of languaging and there's rhythm. So it's, it's possible, I, I, I can't say for sure. So, certainly in the developmental story, it's pretty clear that language emerges out of uh, and Trevathan's done wonderful work on this. Okay, um, it, so l l languaging emerges out of these earlier rhythms and melodies that we then co-synchronize, so that the infant with the with the caregiver and so on. So it, it's deeply and intrinsically musical. Okay, I mean, I didn't want to push the evolutionary story, but some people, and I, I just I can't say, but. but that there are deep affinities, they're not the same thing, but there are deep affinities between language and music, which suggests, like, like Meathan's work, for example, that there may be some evolutionary basis for, for, for claiming that language came out of music. Okay, but I, I'm not going to go there now, I, I can't say. Um, but but the, more, the, 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 the more specific point was that there's a musical base which never leaves us. You know? That, that's there all. Yeah. So, but it's one of the foundational things. And furthermore, it's a type of melody. Now, these are movements. Okay. And they have the capacity to move us. Okay. So in the imitation that we saw in that first video, you know, that, that we see, as I said, the ability to be moved into another space, to inhabit, or so, I guess that's a metaphorical way of putting it, but to inhabit the feelings the experiences of another. Okay, those are earliest forms of imitation already start to show that. Because you the, the affiliation, the bonding and all that. And that's what it does. The dyad in those early months of you know, say the mother and the infant, Trevathan's work, Stein Broughton's work shows this so brilliantly, is driven by affect above all. And then that's the platform, if you like, on which the other so it's musical in a sense from the beginning. Stephen's work too. Stephen's work, and I've done a bit of work on it too. Okay. So music uh, is musicality really is intrinsic, and, and is you know, I mean rhythm is really probably one of the foundational things. Here. That was Darwin's view. I think it's important. Yeah, no, that's absolutely Darwin. right. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's nice to sort of wild and crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the 18, no, 1888 book, I think. Music. So there you are, that bow and set up too. Okay. Great, thank you very much.